Well, welcome. I think we'll get started. We're at our time here. Um, people can continue to trickle in. We hope that uh, you can also find seating up here in the front if you need to have a closer view of the screens. But I know the screens are a little bit partitioned here, so uh, that is the way the room is designed. I am Julie Morgan. I am the president of Tectano Physics. And you are here to hear the Birch Lecture. And prior to the Birch Lecture, I have a couple of announcements. And then I am also going to bestow the Jason Morgan Award on our uh, awardee this year. So first, I just want to mention that uh, um, we, first of all, appreciate that you are here to enjoy the Birch Lecture and to remind you that Tectonophysics is always looking for your help one way or another. And um, there are volunteer opportunities. And if you have interest in participating in the leadership or uh, other activities at uh, AGU or Tectonophysics Society, please let me know. I'd be happy to talk to you a little bit further about that. Um, also, for some people who already know this, Others may not, that tomorrow during the uh, lunch hour, we are going to have a early career mentoring activity. It's a luncheon, and it's joint with seismology, geodesy, and tectonophysics. If you're interested in that, you can see that online and plan to participate. Early career only, unless you're mentoring. And thank you to all the mentors. OK, so right now, I would first like to introduce our Jason Morgan awardee. The Jason Morgan awardee is uh, Jacqueline Osterman. This is our early career award for tectonophysics. Jackie is assistant professor at Columbia University. And I want to provide a little bit of information about her work and how she has earned this award. She's recognized for pioneering an entirely new area of what we can say interdisciplinary study that integrates geodynamic and tectonic processes, which are encapsulated in tectonophysics, with uh, surface processes, in particular looking at ice age paleoclimate. So Jackie received her Master of Science degree at Ludwig Maximilians, did I pronounce that right? Uh, Universität München, where she solved several longstanding problems in plate tectonics relating to driving forces of major plate tectonic events. Consider, for example, the Pacific plate motion change in six million years ago, among others. And then she moved to Harvard University, where she carried out her PhD with Jerry Mitrovica. And there she found her niche examining the role of solid earth dynamics on paleoclimatic processes. And again, worked on resolving several long-standing puzzles, for example, relating to um, excess ice volume during the last glacial maximum and recognizing the role of vertical motions associated with mental processes, so dynamic top topography, and understanding the effects of dynamic topography on sea level changes and ice sheet stability. So in that way, one could say, if plate tectonics is modern geophysics, then what Jackie is introducing is postmodern geophysics. And that is something that moves beyond the basic tenets of plate tectonics into solving time-varying changes that integrate both deep and shallow. So Jackie Osterman is a gifted young scientist and a scholar who has already made fundamental contributions to our understanding of the evolution of the solid earth system and its climate. Jackie, I am pleased to bestow upon you the 2019 Jason Morgan Early Career Award. Congratulations. Thanks so much, Julie. Thanks to all of you for coming here today. Um, I feel incredibly honored for receiving this award. There are definitely a lot of big words in that citation. I don't know if that's all, all right. So, but um, I want to take a couple of minutes to thank the people who've helped me kind of come here and, um, and allow me to stay here today, stand here today. And I'm going to start with the people who've literally helped me to stand here today. And those are the people who nominated me. Uh, this is uh, Jeremy Trevica, Maureen Ramo, Gian Piero Yafaldano, and Dave Rowley. Um, they've been in, uh, incredibly supportive and encouraging over the last 10 years now, and I feel very humbled by their recognition. I also want to thank the tectonophysics division. Um, while my kind of academic work started out tectonophysics-y, um, I've definitely, sort of, as Julie pointed out, moved into other 
uh, divisions and sections and quite literally have been moving back and forth from Moscone South and Moscone West. Um, but I'm definitely a geophysicist at heart and wear this, the orange lanyard with pride. And so I feel very appreciative and thankful that the, that the section um, acknowledges um, and values this, such interdisciplinary work. Over the years, I've been very fortunate uh, to receive excellent mentorship and work with brilliant colleagues and collaborators. Um, I want to start by thanking Jerry Schubert, Hans-Peter Bung, and Jean-Pierre Yefaldanu, who kind of set me off on my academic path and taught me about Earth's interior and its manifestation on the surface. Um, I want to thank, more than anyone else, Jerry Mitruvika, my PhD advisor, and the whole Mitruvika group. Uh, Jerry has guided and, uh, and, and inspired me to bridge the gaps between geodynamics and the paleoclimate record. He's been incredibly generous with his time and his research ideas and has fostered uh, an, a group of incredible collaborators and, and students in the, in the group that I feel very lucky to be, lucky to be a part of. I want to thank CIG, who's been very uh, instrumental in my geodynamic work, as well as my postdoc advisors, David Alatai and Nikki White, who kind of grounded me back to my geodi geodynamic roots during my postdoc time. And lastly, I want to thank my current group who's starting to grow and my collaborators at Lamont. This has really become my uh, scientific home and people there are a constant source of inspiration and I'm very excited to embark on new research projects that try to understand why and how much the Earth is, Earth's surface is going up and down. And I'm going to finish by just thanking you again for listening to me and uh, for particip participating in this event. Thank you. Okay, so right now I would like to introduce the main event, that is our Francis Birch Lecturer. So first, a little background about the Francis Birch Lecture. This is hosted by Tectonophysics Section at AGU. It's one of the Bowie Lectures of AGU. It honors the life and work of Francis Birch, a renowned geophysicist, and is presented annually to a recipient who exemplifies Birch's work, especially those focused on elasticity, phase relations, thermal properties, heat flow, and the composition of the Earth's interior. Our Francis Birch lecturer of 2019 is Claudio Facena. Claudio has had a long affiliation at the University Roma Tre. He started as a researcher there in 1995 after completing his PhD at the University of Rome, La Sapienza. And he did some postdocs at the University of Paris and University of Rennes. He became associate and then full professor at the University of Roma Tre, and he is still there. However, in 2019, Claudio came a little closer to me at Rice University, and he has also joined the faculty at UT Austin, and he accepted the John D. and Carolyn C. Book Out Endowed Chair in Structural Geology. So he's enjoyed quite an exciting career, an illustrious career. He is a structural geologist at heart, but one who incorporates geomorphology, experimental and numerical modeling of geodynamic processes, as well as various geophysical methods. Much of his work has been targeted unraveling the great tectonic puzzles posed by the Mediterranean and the larger Tethian tectonic belt. And he has developed extraordinary insights into subduction and convergent margin tectonics as a, as a result. And, as you will hear, associated mental processes. His publication list is remarkable, very well cited, well documented papers, insightful, and they demonstrate the impact of his research over the years. He's been recognized for his scientific contributions. He's elected fellow of AGU in 2017, only two years ago, received the prestigious Humboldt Research Award in 2015. He received the Stefan Müller Medal of the EGU in 2014, Prix Viquenel Société Géologique de France, oui? Okay, in 2013. 
the Galileo Galilei International Medal for Earth Science in 2010, and he's a member of the Academ Academia Europea since 2010. So, with that, I hope that you will all enjoy Claudio's stimulating presentation. Claudio, if you will come up. We also have a certificate for Claudio and a photo opportunity. Okay. So thanks a lot. Thanks uh, everybody. Thanks Julie for for this introduction. Very generous one. So my talk I should be here. Um, mm, I'm pleased and honored to be uh, 20, the 29 uh, Birch lecturer actually. And uh, uh, I I was supposed to give a talk mainly focused on the Mediterranean, but then I thought it was a little bit too intense. 45 minutes of Mediterranean. So <laughs> I think a <laughs> broader view of uh, uh, the Mediterranean, like in a broader context, and, and so I will talk about the relationship between uh, subduction, mountain dynamics, and mountain building. And this is a work that we've been running over a large part of my career and sharing with a number of friends and colleagues, and some of them are listed here. There's a lot of students as well, and I would like to thank all for the contribution. So it's, it is, of course, an ongoing process and project. So let me start from the beginning. Um, so I think now we do have uh, good uh, ideas or, and good models that provide uh, convection and provide uh, uh, simulation of the long-term uh, evolution of the Earth system. And this is, for example, uh, a nice model by Nico Coltis, just published, where it's showing uh, subduction, collision, and, and, uh, oops, and, and, uh, and uh, um, assembly of continents that emerge spontaneously from convection models. So this is a... Uh, uh, pretty interesting. Uh, we can also take another approach and, and we can see that uh, convection model uh, properly uh, simulate the motion of, this, of the large oceanic plate, like uh, for example the Pacific, once you invert uh, the tomography uh, anomaly for, for density. Uh, so, but uh, however, when you do go over beneath the continental plate, the things are a little bit more complicated. And, and we don't know really how is the pattern of convection. This is uh, one example I bring here uh, for the formation and the formation of Colorado Plateau. And this has been explained, for example, by large-scale convection and the group of uh, uh, Alex Porter and Rob Mucha here, or by small-scale convection by Carl Castro. And oh, maybe they're both together acting, so uh, this is uh, getting a little bit more complex. And uh, uh, when you go at subduction zone and in converging margin, you have the whole range of uh, possibility uh, uh, on time and the scale of convection. So for example, here you may have a small scale convection operating in the back arc area just to explain the high heat flow or a toroidal flow as lab edges that uh, it should work uh, 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 at all scale. Or you can go have a, a mantle wedge, entire upper mantle that circulated, just to explain, for example, the off-axis volcanism that they found in China. Or when the subduction zone enters into the lower mantle, then you should expect, of course, to have a, a large-scale uh, process acting. So the question we like to approach with you today is, uh, what do we have? Uh, and when you do a constructed mountain building, what is the style of convection and the subduction? Is that make any role or is completely independent? And this is a question, of course, that uh, is uh, um, at the center of our community that is uh, between geodynamic and, and, and tectonics and structural geology. And there is a different view. And so I would like to discuss with, about that today. And to do that, first, uh, I would like to revise very quickly the force at work, maybe in a very uh, simple way, um, during, during construction of a, of a mountain. So of course, when you construct a mountain, you build up energy, potential energy. So, so the main resistant force is, is, is this one. And the acting force may be two type. One is stored in the lithosphere. And the first one, for example, is ridge push. 
and, and the ridge pushes nothing else than GPA between the ridge and the uh, abyssal plane and can be enhanced by, for example, the capture of a, of a plume, like has been proposed by uh, several people on the case of India. And then the other force that is the classical force is the slab pull force, and everybody know about that, and it's basically the negative buoyancy of the, uh, of the, of the slab while falling down into the mantle, and, and, uh, and, uh, and can be, of course, uh, one of the driving force for the plates. And what is resisting is probably the man when the lithospheric forces are very uh, uh, vigorous, the mantle is resisting, of course, the motion of the lithosphere. However, if you do have uh, the rupture of the slab, for example, during the protracted collision, we do expect that this, the, the oceanic part will fall down, or the deep penetration of the slab into the lower mantle, the mantle can start playing an important role, dragging plates uh, one against the other. So we still have, we don't really know, there are competition of these two forces and, 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 and it's difficult to balance the two. And also when you look at the past, what has been proposed as uh, the main driving forces for, for, for orogeny, uh, we do have uh, the case for, it's been proposed by Arthur Holmes first in his seminal book that I invite you all guys, especially the young one, to read it, where they propose that big scale mantle convection may operate at inverting a, a geosyncline and cr producing crustal root and mountain in the 31. And this has been going and tested also by experiment by Greeks, et cetera, and have elaborated further on also by Walter Wallace. More recently, I would say our attention has been most, mostly on, on, uh, on the way the lithospheric and, and the crust are coupled together and on the way the crust deform. So, uh, for example, during this nice subduction, we also be able to couple subduction with the erosion on the surface. And during slab pool, you create erogeny and, and, and much attention on the way you partition the formation within the erosion itself. So my working hypothesis here is just that I would like to uh, bring it to you is uh, that the style of mountain building does depend on, on the interplay between subduction and mantle dynamic and mantle convection. And, and, and to, to do that, I will try to bring you to a journey into the Tatian belt, which is uh, the place where I know more. So the Tatian belt is an impressive structure. It's probably one of the main origin we do have on Earth. It's running from Gibraltar to Southeast Asia. And this is a ni very nice map, geological map by Manuel Poubelier, where the color are not the rocks, but are the time of the formation, the time of accretion of blocks into Asia. Because the story of the Tetian belt is just because we have the consumption of the, a couple of ocean, Paleotetis and the Neotetis, and, and the block that's created, separated from, from Gondwana, then are created to Asia. And it's a long term accretion of block starting from the Paleozoic and going uh, younger to the, uh, to the Mesozoic and to the present day uh, position where it's still active. So the result in the tertiary of this process are mountain. So we have the Alps, of course, everybody know that. Uh, but if you move eastward, then the mountain get very big. And is this, for example, the uh, Zagros Persian Plateau at Kopedag here in a section running to Iran. And if you go farther east, we have the well-known Himalayan Tibetan system where the cross reached more than, than uh, 70 kilometer thickness. So the, 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 the biggest mountain belt we have on Earth. So the erogeny at different scale in, increasing in size eastward, and the velocity also do the same. So the, 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 when you plot the, G, the, G, the GPS velocity of the crustal block, Arabia, India, and Adria that are accreting to Asia now with respect to, to um, a regional reference frame fix, then you can see that this block is still moving with a velocity toward the north. And then there is a, a very nice, almost symmetric return flow of escape of material out of the collisional zone toward the active uh, Hellenic uh, trench on the east and to uh, the other uh, trench on the Pacific and Indonesia. So uh, it is instructive to look at the kinematic, the long-term kinematic of this process. So here we can see uh, G plates reconstruction where you can see the two crustal block, the well-known India acceleration and, and then the, uh, arrive to, uh, to, to, to Asia. 
And on, on, the, on the right, you can see on green the uh, velocity of India. It's a well-known path of velocity with a peak on velocity more than 15 centimeters around the, the Paleocene, when then place on the Deccan trap, and then a sharp decrease in velocity, and then attaining a, fine, a rather constant velocity. So while it's intuitively understandable that the decrease in velocity between 60 and 40 million years is, can be attributed to the fact that the India somehow was colliding, the age of collision is uncertain and it's been discussed so far, but that would be probably the onset of that. While it's completely not understood is the fact that the Indias keep going at uh, five centimeter here or something less at the same rate without perturbation, irrespective of the fact that it's building up an enormous mountain belt. And, and Arabian is even more impressive because Arabia is keep going at the same rate in Africa and then separate about 30 million years ago with the uh, form, forming ocean and then keep going inside uh, Asia at the same rate. And, and now they are more or less the same. So we do have a record of a constant velocity of this block that is, uh, that is indenting inside Asia. So let me start the journey in the Mediterranean, which is the region I know more, and I'm gonna spend more time there. So the Mediterranean is considered to be a puzzle because there's a plenty of microplate and moving, uh, Anatolia, Aegea, and Hadria, separating irrespective of the motion of Africa, which is very slow toward the, uh, Eurasia. And what is interesting is that you can find a very complicated pattern of erosion that are turning around, forming very tight arc that are including a stational or oceanic basin, like uh, the Bedics here, the Bedic Heart, then you have Calabria, the Western Alps, the Carpathian, the Elenai, the Cyprus. So it's, it's all like a snake of origin surrounding oceanic basin, okay? Uh, um, uh, for, to understand better the evolution of the Mediterranean, here reconstruction we done with Wiki Royd and High, and, and it's, uh, it's very illustrative. The color here are just the, it starts on the mind of Myosin, and the color here are the water depth. So the blue is the abyssal plain. You have two subduction zones running, and then they start uh, approaching each other very slowly. And uh, uh, so 20 million year, opening a back arc basin here, another back arc basin here, and they move one against the other, uh, so closing and consuming the Adria plate, which is partly continental, partly oceanic. As for example, here the Lenic Trench is start consuming the Ionian Ocean. And while consuming, approaching each other, they lose pieces and it became getting bigger, smaller and smaller up to the present day setting. And what we also done, we and I, is, uh, is to stretch our imagination to uh, see what can be the future of the Mediterranean. This is pretty interesting. Five million years is a joke, of course. And you see that, for example, we do expect to have a simplification of the subduction zone. So the Atlantic will merge the Calabria, and you can have uh, an inversion of the Ligure, the Ligure Provencal basin that starts subducting and maybe opening a new ocean. So this is a, a nice story. So the trace of that process is, is in the mantle, pretty clearly imaged by the uh, tomography here. And this is here a model by Claudia Piromallo and Andrea Morelli, published some years ago, but showing clearly that beneath the main origin, you have the high velocity anomaly. So I, for example, Calabria, Northern Apennine, the Alps, the Dinarai, the Hellenites, and also something in Africa, North Africa. But also you can see that at this depth, 150, this is a P-wave model, um, you can see that there are the, the, those anomalies are separated by a very low velocity anomaly. But when you go deeper into the mantle, uh, those anomalies merge together, forming a larger zone. And, and when you go at the bottom of the upper mantle, there you have a very large high velocity zone that is uh, expanding in, in this area in a very interesting way. And is this probably, be re this was the ocean that separate, uh, that separate uh, the Tetian Ocean that separate Africa to Eurasia, and now fall down at the bottom of the outer mantle, stagnating on the transition zone, and probably ready to fall down as it already done in the, in the, in the lower mantle, as it done in the Aegean part here. So the other information we do have on the mantle is the SKS trend. The SKS is an impressively uh, nice data set that we do have now. So you can see in the Western Mediterranean, the pattern of SKS is trending east-west. It's rather constant. It goes down to Africa as well with a little, uh, uh, a little distortion in the, around the Bedic Arcs. 
And, and this is pointing out basically the uh, subduction zone of the Calabrian area where you do have mostly trench parallel SKS. On the west, on the eastern side, again, we have uh, the SKS is completely different. It's trending northeast, southeast, and it's pointing out again the Atlantic Trench. So we do have region where the pattern of the SKS that gave us the anisotropy into the mantle integrated for some hundred kilometers is pretty constant and, and pointing out to uh, the, the, the Atlantic zone and it's basically parallel to the, to, to the extensional trajectory of the trench migration. So the result of this process is the opening of two Beccarc Basin, for example, in the center of the Mediterranean, with a rollback of more than 800 kilometers, which is quite impressive. It was not a continuous process, but a jumping, like uh, with first opening one basin and then the other. And, and, and also, the result of that is a, a nice lab fall down quite steeply and then flattening on the 660 discontinuity. And on the front of this uh, trench, you can form mountain. Little origin, like the Apennine. And when you go and zoom inside, this is a picture we have done combining, for example, receiver function with the sism past seismic. And we can plot pretty well the Moho and the, and the S point where you can have the Adria plate subducting and the, uh, and the upper plate. And you can realize that the upper plate is just done, constructed by scraping slices of crust from Hydria, they attach it to the upper plate. So is this crust is floating on, on the mantle, on the asthenosphere fundamentally. And, and, and in fact, the origin have very low taper. And when you zoom here, uh, you can see that the forehead deep of this basin are very, very deep. So it, it's a very important uh, uh, signal of dynamic topography that you can find there. So the, when you go in the field, this is what we saw. It's a beautiful mountain when uh, constructed with a trust and fold belt classically, but cross cut by active normal fault. Like here, this is the Castelluccio Plain, which is a very nice area actually, and is struck by recently by this earthquake. So the trace of the normal fault is now the ecosystem fracture you can see here. And uh, so all in all, the current pattern of the formation of the Mediterranean is this one, can be summarized here. We already see the GPS, the regional reference frame fix, uh, with an acceleration of the motion of Anatolia and then toward the Aegean even more, constructing this counterclockwise, very nice rotation pattern on a, on a polar rotation that is positioned more or less on the Nile Delta. And also the other point is Adria that is moving in this direction. But those to play this microplate actually move completely respectively of the motion of Africa, that is basically this guy or this guy that is moving very slowly towards the Eurasia. So the question now, what is driving the action of this microplate? And what is this dominant style of subduction and mantle convection there? So uh, I like, I am, I'm happy to, to, to show that uh, actually the Mediterranean was the source of a main important process uh, on, on subduction, which is called, called, commonly called flap rollback. And I probably the first one to point it out that is Alberto Malinvello and Bill Ryan in his seminal paper in 86, where they're showing basically that under the pool of a slab, you can open without convergence, you can open a backcrack basin on the back and then constructing a, a little mountain on the top. And, and, the, and the formation of the arc is derived by the fact that uh, you have a paleogeography with a corridor of ocean here, so the, the consumption is, is, is addressed and, and in, in, in this direction. And we could soon after realize that the forehead deep depth, which is anomalous, uh, can be not be explained by the load of the mountain, but we do need a, a sublithospheric load, which is the slab pool, actually. So under the load of the slab, you can have all this deformation. And, may, and the rupture of the slab in, in some area can propagate laterally also, and this has been well imaged by Rhinos Volta and Big Spackman in a number of papers, and can accelerate the trench retreat, or that can also produce by the, an external amount of flow, and, and uh, like pointed out by Carlo Doglioni. And, and this is uh, an interesting, so you can move from this to more sophisticated numerical model that uh, Valentina and have done for recently, for example, showing that the formation of the arcs is produced by the fact that you have to broke laterally the slab, and so you have a very narrow and tight arc. So, but the question we would like to address here today is, uh, can we really have a picture of what is doing the mantle today beneath the Mediterranean? And to answer that, 
we're gonna have, uh, we take all the, the problem with a completely different approach. We take the anomaly from the uh, seismic tomography and, and we invert it to density. So the low velocity anomaly go up, the high velocity anomaly simply go down. So the assumption under that is, of course, is a very strict and uh, the method that we will use it is fundamentally having a global flow model with a number of assumptions uh, uh, using SITCOM with incompressible laminar flow. We test a number of configuration for changing viscosity and boundary zone. And our, again, the, assumption, the strict assumption is that we convert all the density anomaly into, into uh, uh, temperature and, and density. So it means that we do not hollow for any uh, chemical anomaly besides combined continental uh, kills. So this assumption is strict, but the good news is that we can compare and uh, contrast the model against data, and this is also interesting. So we can directly uh, contrast the model against uh, uh, the motion of the plate and the dynamic topography and mantle anisotropy. Uh, we'll run quickly onto some of this uh, uh, model. So this is the result of one of these models. The gray arrow here, uh, the Africa and Arabia motion imposed. The white arrow result from the model itself, so it's simply free to do whatever you want. And the origin is again the GPS, average reference frame fix. So you can see that Anatolia is doing okay, it's moving eastward, but you can also see that uh, terrible job for Aegea, so we don't match at all Aegea, let's say probably because uh, this model don't know include uh, uh, important ingredient of crustal deformation, like also GPA. But also we can see the Adria is doing uh, quite okay, so it's uh, getting independent on the motion of Africa. But what I think is even more important here, beside the, 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 the result, is to capture the, what is happening at depth. And, and this is better to see when you do a cross section running from Caucasus, crossing Anatolia, going uh, Atlantic Trench, Calabria, and going down to to uh, France, which is actually, uh, it's, it's, and so here you can see uh, the cross section. So you see the pattern of mantle that are pulling in the nearest, dragging Anatolia on the base with a flow that is uh, basically a return flow of the retreating red trench, uh, Atlantic Trench, and then go up again and go down again in Calabria. It's very narrow, it's get close together, and go up again in the Massif Central. So what we are observing fundamentally here is a very small scale convection confined from the base of the lithosphere to the top of the transition zone. And this is, I think, is a very nice result and something new. And, and it give, thanks to the fact that we have an high resolution tomography, we can capture this signal that may produce an important deformation on the surface. And so you can better appreciate that if we slice our model and then you see patches of material going up, patches of material that's going down at different depth, 100 and 400. But then when you go down into transition zone, everything flat down. So just to say that is a really small scale convection operating uh, in the very upper part of the mantle. So we can compare our model with the dynamic topography. Um, and first, before doing that, we have to uh, probably uh, try to uh, estimate what is the residual topography. The residual topography is nothing else than uh, filtering out by the to from, the, from the actual topography the contribution of isostasy. So we will assume that we know the density and the coastal thickness, and we do have a rough idea in the Mediterranean, and the mantle lithosphere, and we take out this contribution, and this is what is left. So you see basically that uh, no much of the area in the Mediterranean looks in isostasy, so everything in the west looks more elevated than should be, and, and uh, apart from the area where you have the subduction zone running, that is uh, more, uh, it's subsiding more than it should be, and Anatolia again a little bit up. And all you can also, contrast the result of this model with a completely different data set when you can estimate the residual topography out of the converting free air gravity anomaly uh, as from Craig et al. 2011. And if you do that exercise, you just you see that there are a little bit of convergence, the amount are different, the area, some of the area here are more a really strong signal that is going up to a couple of kilometers in this, uh, in this, uh, uh, and in some other is less than that. But the, the, the trend is similar. So what you can do is compare the residual topography now with the dynamic topography that is calculated out of the model. And you can see that it doesn't work. <laughs> 
fundamentally, it, uh, it, is, uh, it doesn't really work in some, very, in some area, but in, if you look in detail, you can find that some of the, uh, some of the uh, areas show the same pattern, like here in the Western Mediterranean, the central uh, Apennine, for example, and also the high velocity anomaly, the, 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 the negative signal that you can find beneath the Hellenic and the Dina right here and the Hellenic here. So this is some a feature that you can see in both models. So you can also go in the field and do a, a more detailed analysis of the topography, for example, just on top of a subduction zone. And this can be interesting. For example, looking on the Apennine along strike here, then you have uh, the poor plain that is subsiding and Venice is under the water, okay? And, and Calabria also here, that is probably uh, negative. And also you have a, a positive signal here. So when you do the top, look at the topography, uh, you have uh, that uh, the Apennine is uh, more elevated and it's in the central area and it's going down the northern Apennine in Calabria. And if you plot the crustal thickness, you see that the trend of these two curves are similar, just indicating that uh, isostasy cannot be the cause of that because otherwise I would expect to have the crustal root here in the area of more elevation. And so this is to say that if you plot the residual topography, it does have the same trend that, uh, the, uh, the, that the, of the topography. And it's to say that uh, the active portion of the slab show a negative residual topography of some hundred meters. And in both sides, in Calabria and the Northern Apennine, where the slab is actually active. So this is pulling down the topography and depressing that by a factor of 500, 400 or 500. Whereas when you go in the central Apennine, the, as the area is more elevated, it should be by the same factor, plus 400 or 500. And it, this is interesting because it means that uh, isostasy, in, in, of course, is operating here, but the dynamic signal on top of a subduction zone can be very relevant. Um, so we go over the Mediterranean and we start doing a field work to try to, to see whether the residual topography that we estimate is really a geological feature and is something that we can measure like a, from a geological perspective. And this is a really an interesting work. We can put numbers on the uplift. For example, on the Berrien chain, you can find more than 500 meters of, uh, uh, of uplift in the last three million years, the Massive Central also, something like that, and, and also in area like the high atlas where the uplift is enormous, about more than 1,200 meters uh, uh, in the last five million years. And, 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 and what is, it? but there are areas where, where this, this, this work doesn't match, for example, in the Alps, where we do have a very fast uplift, but the residual topography is almost zero. So those are the area where probably other process, uh, more sufficient process like unloading for, for glacial and, and for sediment related to the glaciation maybe uh, explain a, a large part of this very uh, high, uh, very fast uplift in the Alps. So finally, you can end up and looking at the mantle anisotropy. Mantle anisotropy is showing a pretty good match in the blue is the good and the red is bad in, this, in the, in the Bekak region, so uh, over uh, Iberia and over Anatolia. So indicating that the return flow uh, generated by the mantle in, in our model, it can explain fairly well the pattern of SKS that we do have. But we do know match uh, Alps again is a mystery for everything. <laughs> so when you work there, you can understand that, that there is also always a problem. Um, so ending up with the Mediterranean, with this uh, fast run over the process uh, uh, operating there, I think we can, we can be pretty sure that the subduction has lap, this is a system where subduction has lap pool dominated most of the deformation. We have two slabs falling down, the Calabria and the Atlantic. They basically touch each other, forming a sink in the middle of the Mediterranean. And then this, may, this process may explain pretty, pretty well the visodicity on the Kark extension and all the microplate motion. And, and, and in terms of orogeny, what we form here is a, usually a low topography, low taper orogenic wedge, asymmetric, pointing out toward the subduction zone with very deep for deep and low crustal thickness, less than 50 kilometer. And usually there's a, a large uh, isomation of high pressure and low temperature unit there. So the question now is, is this kind of process, subduction dominated, operated also in other systems of the big orogeny? 
And for that, we're going to move out in the other area where the thing's getting more bigger. So when you look at that, so you, we also have to look at a different tomography. This is a global tomography for us, mean, for example, where you do have uh, dominated on over the Tetian area, where you do have uh, two very low velocity, very strong low velocity anomaly, one in the far, another in the other Kazbek ridge, and you also have a, a high velocity anomaly related to the Tetian subduction that is uh, going down at least in the upper part of the lower mantle. So just to let you understand, the resolution jump that we do have moving from the Mediterranean to a global scale is this one. So of course, when we try to look at what happened in the mantle, the features that we will observe are larger. Huh? And this is one of the experiments we've done through the same principle, so using anomaly tomography anomaly and converting that. And, uh, and, and the result is, this time we don't impose any, any plate velocity, erasure reference frame fix, and we see that fundamentally the two microplates, Arabia and India, they doing roughly in the good direction under the flow in the mantle, and uh, we also see that uh, uh, area that uh, doing very bad, for example, Africa is running too fast here, also Australia is now going the right direction, but we also tested this big plate motion doesn't really play a fundamental role on the, on, the, on the small scale, on the small motion of the block like Arabia and India. So to better understand what is happening, we can go down and look at a uh, depth at 300 kilometers and doing cross section. So you can see the trace of the two low velocity anomaly, the Afar and the Kazbek ridge here, and you can also see the trace of the high velocity anomaly uh, related to the Tetian belt. And if you do a cross-section AB here, what you realize is that you have a, a convection cell that is running in this way, so pull, push, dragging an Arabia, in our point of view, against the Asia, and, 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 and doing a wool mantle story, mantle convection. So it's a sort of a conveyor belt, we call it. And then when you do look at uh, what happened uh, beneath uh, India, we found the same story, and even more pronounced, we have the Kalsberg Ridge running here, and, and, and the, the flow going up, uh, pushing India northward, and then going down in the Tetian Belt, uh, and the Tetian Anomaly, and come back in this way. So just to have another look of that, you can see the tomography here. This time it's a different tomography from MIT. You have the high velocity anomaly that underlying the Asia here, and is underplating fundamentally, and you have this large blob here into the mantle. And the result of this deformation, again, is the formation of this double vergent wedge, where you have the Himalayan Tibet with a very thick crustal thickness. So if you plot the age of the trench, the position of the trench in time, done by, for example, ripple mats at all, then you can see that these low high velocity anomaly here match pretty well the position of uh, of the uh, trench at that time, so it's probably fitted by the subduction zone when it was there, and then the subduction zone keep rolling over the, the, the falling piece into the lower mantle to the present day setting. And while doing that, it's stalled in this large scale convection. And, and so the deep, this large scale convection should have probably start around 60 million years, so at the time that uh, you have the falling down of uh, the slam material into the lower mantle and the first upwelling of the, for example, the Deccan trap. So running to the conclusion, in the Tetian belt, what we see is a multi-scale scale of convection. So if we do have a good resolution on tomography, you can capture small-scale stuff, maybe embedded in a large uh, uh, cell, convection cell. And in our opinion, in, the, in this kind of convection, I mean, it's dragging the two plate one against the other, and this can be protracted for tens of million years. Here, cl clearly, it's Lapool is inefficient, and you form this big mountain belt, uh, pretty symmetric, high topography, high crustal thickness, and double vergent wedge. And the role of GPA, of course, is not in our model and can be fundamental, as also shown by a recent paper by Gosh, and, and, and should be also analyzed. So the other question now is uh, this large-scale mantle convection apply also to other orogeny or it's just a, a peculiarity of the Tethys? <coughs> and to look at that, we have to, again, zooming out. And now we have uh, the full picture of the uh, mantle. 
at the base of the lower mantle, we have uh, the well-known large low-velocity shear province, Tuzo and Jezu, one beneath Africa and one beneath uh, uh, Pacific. And we do have the trace also of the uh, high-velocity anomaly. And this is more clear when you look uh, into uh, uh, upper lower mantle depth, around 1,000 kilometers here, where you do have this uh, very nice uh, Tetian suture that is uh, clearly running from the Aegean to the Asia, where I will see today. And the other is, is the Codier one, running fundamentally from North America down to at least half of the South America. <coughs> so these two structures form what we call, what has been called the Indo-Atlantic box. I think it's a very, very great idea to see two slabs that is uh, fundamentally confining a large low velocity shear province that is uh, between that. And in fact, if you do a cross-section, then you have this classical picture with uh, two large low-velocity anomaly pointed out here, the Africa super swell, feeding the far, for example, and the Pacific one. And then, in an antipodal way, you do have the Cordillera on one side with all the material, and on the other side, the Tetian belt. So uh, with the, uh, the Pacific, the contribution either from the Pacific and mostly from, from India. So this is uh, fundamentally giving the, this degree two pattern that we do know and is also already in the textbook. And the question now that we're gonna pose is that is this Cordillera a subduction orogeny or a mantle orogeny? And, and is there any relationship between the Tetian orogeny then and the Cordillera one? And so this is not an easy question and we like to I go run to, to the area here on the Cordillera introducing to the system. And drink a little bit of water. So. <clears throat> so this is uh, the South America, and uh, you have, uh, um, we know South America is moving westward and uh, against Nazca, and you do also have the record of the motion of South America during the last 120 million years, which is the westward drift. So it's going much of the Mesozoic at a velocity around four, three centimeter here, and then it's glowing, slowing down during the tertiary, and we are testing to a velocity around two to three centimeter per year, constantly toward, uh, uh, toward the west. And during this pattern, I mean, most of the time, uh, South America form a little orogenic wedge, but also extensional basin here, so that the trench is probably moving at the same rate of what South America is doing. But at a certain moment, the hand is growing up, so the trench slowed down progressively, and you start having the deformation on the, on the, on the Andes. So the question here in South America is basically, if you want to understand why you form a mountain belt here, you have to understand why, what is the reason for the trench at the moment around 50 million years to decrease its motion toward the west and, 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 uh, and, and around 50 million years. So what is the reason for this change? And to understand that, we have to go again deep and look what happened to the slab in South America. This is a classical cross-section on the Bolivian Arctic, uh, Altiplano and uh, Orocline. And you do have the high-velocity anomaly here from MIT model IP wave again, falling down straight down into the lower mantle, down to a 1,000 kilometer depth. And the trace of this high-velocity anomaly, you can see, you can follow quite clearly and straight from the north, actually, North America, down to 25, 24 south. It's a pretty continuous feature. And so what you can do here, what the exercise you can do is to try to restore, for example, the trench in time. And this is an exercise that's been done by several people. So we redo that, actually, and, and we correct the absolute, just restoring back our South America for an absolute reference frame with a number of different models and correcting the trench for the deformation on, on, the, on the Andes as well. So you can see the position of the trench, we expect 190, 80, 70, 60, and you can see that the basically the position of the trench of 50 plus or minus 10 line up pretty well with the position of the high velocity anomaly. That is to say that uh, we couldn't have the penetration of the slab prior to 60 or 70, otherwise the slab should have been reclined backward. 
So the present and also the fact that it's pretty straight, imagine the, the, the entrance of the slab, let us thinking that the penetration of the slab probably occur around 50 to plus or minus 10 million years. So it means that the penetration of the slab is roughly contemporaneous with the onset of orogeny, at least in this northern part of South America. And so you can also do an exercise here. So taking a 0.3 velocity anomaly from your tomography and, and, and unfolding the slab back in time uh, and so that uh, you can have uh, restoring back the amount of, uh, of oceanic lithosphere that is subducted in time. And it turned out that uh, you easily have uh, uh, eliminated all the high velocity anomaly at 0.3 in the 60 to 70 million year of subduction. And the penetration actually occur roughly at that time. So it doesn't mean that there was no subduction prior to that, so below South America, because we know that there was subduction, but we cannot see that probably in the tomography. Also because the, the seafloor that was subducting at the time was pretty young, so there may be a problem. So it, this is also referred to to more recent paper published uh, on, that, on that problem. So, there is a, so it means the, our analysis show that the penetration of the slab into the mantle and the onset of erogeny is something that occur contemporaneously. But how it works? So to better understand that, we run very simple model. This is Adam Old model uh, run in our paper uh, done with Don Onken and Tostenbecker. And, and, and you can capture the first order process. And, and you have to pay attention to this color here. The widest compression and, 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 and looking at the slab penetrating to the lower mantle here, you can see that the compressional area get larger. So there is a connection between these two processes and how it works. There are two reasons to explain that. The first one is that when the slab penetrating to the lower mantle is anchored, and then it has all time to roll back. And therefore, if the South Americans keep going at the same rate, then you have to uh, start shortening. And the second process that go together with the first one is that you can start install a very large scale convection cell when you penetrate into the lower mantle. And this convection cell, what it's doing is basically dragging one plate against the other, forming an origin. So uh, even for the case of the Andes, I think the onset of the Cordillera shortening may be related to slab penetration and anchoring to the lower mantle. And the fact that when you go south, of the, of the uh, high velocity anomaly in the lower mantle, the deformation is lower, may is well in agreement with that. And this has been found also, same process probably occurring in, in, uh, in, in, in Southeast Asia. Uh, so in, also in this case, we have to think that uh, to explain the extreme crustal thickening that we do have below the altiplano, we need to have mantle drag that producing, that uh, bring one plate against the other. But if it's true, it means that uh, irrespective of the nature of the subducting plate and on the plate contact, this is completely different moving from the Tethys to the Cordillera, we can have uh, th those two orogeny share very common features like uh, in terms of mantle convection cell and, and, uh, and both of them were active actually at the same time. So the, the idea of the Indo-Atlantic box is really interesting uh, as, as uh, first shown by, by Andavail and Paul Silver. So um, if it's true, or this story is also true, that uh, we, do, uh, we do have to imagine that uh, the degree to mantle pattern of mantle convection that we observe today into the mantle with this nice convection cell, these four, are active at least for the downwelling part only in the tertiary, because prior to that, no big deep mantle uh, process was occurring in these two along these two big uh, high velocity anomaly area. And, and if it's true, it also means that we can use probably mountain building to, to episode in the geological record to identify vigorous episode of uh, wool mantle convection. So this run to the, this bring us to the last question, what is happening in the previous orogeny? And, and uh, of course, this is more difficult to extract this point, but uh, we can go back to the very last big origin that we have on Earth during the continental assembly in the Pangaea time. At that time, we actually formed a number of mountain belts, but what is really amazing is that you form a terrestrial orogeny that is a peripheral orogeny, like the Cordillera one, and at the same time, you are forming a collisional orogeny 
that is running is basically the Variscan Wachita and Allegian orogeny that is running this way. So these two orogeny was forming together exactly like we have now with a, with a peripheral orogeny and a colliding orogeny at the same time. And this is very interesting, and I think this means that probably this episode of mantle convection was probably occurring also at the time and may explain the fact that uh, uh, you produce somehow and trigger the supercontinental assembly with this kind of, of, of uh, uh, feature. So we're running to my conclusion. So I think mountain building, uh, we, we take the Carolina uh, uh, and, and Clint uh, uh, idea of uh, using this term, slab pool orogeny, slab suction orogeny. We can divide orogeny in two classes, slab pool orogeny, Mediterranean type. We see everywhere in the world this kind of, of model. It's not a Mediterranean one. Our orogenic wedge with the low taper, low crustal thickness, and, 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 uh, and uh, contained by small scale convection. And on the other side, complete the slab suction orogeny. So in this case, we need a wool mantle convection that is able to protract the collision for long times, so to build up this big plateau of uh, an, an, an extreme cluster thickness, which is something that is, uh, is, uh, is uh, uh, not common, I would say. And, 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 uh, and, uh, and, and in this case, we have to have a large scale convection. But you can go from one to the other, actually, during the penetration. If you penetrate your slab into the low mantle, which is actually, actually occur after uh, some times, so you can, uh, the, your orogenic wedge may be transformed in a slab suction, uh, produce a crustal thickening, and enter in this slab suction orogenic kind of type. But you also go back, you can go back if you, for example, you have break off, and your deeper part of the, of the, of the anomaly is, is not connected anymore with the shallower one, then you may go to an orogenic collapse and, 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 and ending up to a small orogeny. So this cycle can be a cycle about uh, uh, 100 million years or so. So I'm concluding here with uh, my, my just uh, final remark. This is the view of a structural geologist that is very interested in geodynamics and in collaboration with many friends. So I think we have to uh, 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 care a lot about what mantle convection is doing and, and, and the contribution from the mantle is relevant, although it's still poorly quantified and, and can be explained a lot of lithospheric deformation. Um, we, I also think that uh, while subduction may explain the orogenic wedge, this is more easy to understand, to have extreme coastal thickening event require the contribution for mantle. So the entire mantle have to move to, co to build up this big mountain belt. And we need to test this hypothesis, of course, and we need a better understanding of the way the mantle is coupled, and we need to have a better model that, that may explore the feedback between the surface process, mantle, crustal deformation, and mantle convection. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I would like also to dedicate uh, this uh, talk to Jean-Pierre, that uh, was me for a long time, and uh, we were writing together a nice uh, paper on the erogeny and left us uh, prem prematurely a month ago. Thank you very much for me. Nice talk, Claudio. Have you looked at the balance of the suction associated with interaction of the slab at the 660 compared to something like a continent entering the trench, which can counteract that? Like, what are the relative magnitudes of those different forces? And can you just generate an orogeny entirely by a continental collision as opposed to suction from the 660? So the question is, uh, the interplay between uh, mantle, this, uh, the lithospheric force lap pool and, and, and mantle drag, how they, they, they interplay, the, the level of two, the two and the deformation of that, how, see if we can quantify that in different. In the case of continental right. Um, for the case, sorry, no, I didn't get that then, the, the question, sorry with me. So have you looked at the comparison, say a continent is entering the trench 
Right. And you know, how much would that yeah, counteract yeah, 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 the suction yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. of No, Now that's a very interesting question. For example, you can build up subduction orogeny because uh, you can scrape off, and this is the case, we, a lesson that we learned from the Mediterranean, you can scrape off the crustal side, and so you can keep going with the subduction and kind of delamination, more or less, with the mantle that still keep going down, and you can consume easily hundreds of kilometers of uh, continental passive margin, for example. We have uh, in the northern Appen an active subduction still going with after more than 350 kilometers of continental subduction. So this is a possible mechanism if, if you delaminate uh, properly the crustal part from that. And with Jampier, we were estimating that we can consume easily a block up to 400 kilometers for normal buoyancy before completely stack the system and initiate a new subduction. Ah, right. Aha, uh -huh. that's a good question. The kid side test the hypothesis. I, I think actually, um, uh, I, I think we should go better understanding on the Andes, for example. So uh, Barbara Carapa, for example, was leading a very nice project trying to, to understand at the boundary where you have the penetration of the, uh, the subduction into the mantle, 25 more or less south. And, and, and to the south, where you don't have it, if, if this process is really meaningful, we should expect, we should mark better what is the transition between this area where the slab penetrated more than the other, and what is the consequence on the surface, so, and, and also the age. So this is a, a very nice area to test that. That's uh, that was the idea. Yeah, exactly. That, that is the idea. So, we, it, because the system is now all under compression, so the you are basically having the when when you when the when the system can go in compression, so you expect to have a passive margin maybe inverting in the Atlantic, and then if it's so, then then once you have the, an introversal again, and and then Wilson cycle can close again. So, but this is the condition. You have to go in the lower mantle for having this large-scale convection to run. And if it's so, you can, you can have all the system in compared. I, sh I think I have uh, one slide, if you are interested to see that, um, that can show that kind of uh, process that we have in mind. It's just a, it's just a, a speculative uh, right idea we've been working on. So it's a conceptual model. You're going to slap pool orogeny for the two orogeny called the Yera and the India and Malaya. But then when they, when they do penetrate into the lower mantle, you start having compression here, compression here. And then, uh, uh, and then uh, you can invert the margin then because all the system is in compression. And you start a new subduction on the Atlantic, for example, on the Brazilian side here, where we do know that is under compression now, the margin, or here. And at this point, you can have really the condition to have a new phase of continental assembly. So yes, exactly the point. But it's just a speculative idea, just this very, <laughs> just in my mind. You need to wait a long time. Yeah, I never brought that. <laughs>